is the rapture at the seventh trumpet. I'm Jay Kennedy, your last day's pastor. Today, we're going to continue our teaching on uh, this seventh trumpet rapture idea and trying to answer this question uh, as to whether or not the rapture happens at the seventh trumpet. In part one, uh, we looked at the book of Revelation and how to read it and how to understand how all of the different storylines converge at the seventh trumpet and what we call the sickle reaping of the Son of Man. So today, in this video, I want to uh, go into all of the other scriptural depictions of the rapture. We're going to examine this concept of the uh, seventh trumpet sickle reaping rapture and see if it agrees and lines up with all of the other scriptures about the rapture that we have and the resurrection because they're one and the same, right? Um, you know, the Bible has a whole lot more to say about uh, believers or the people of God being resurrected rather than snatched away. I know we like to talk about the rapture a lot, but the primary component of this event is really the resurrection. And those of us who, alive, who, are, who remain and are alive, we get to be a part of it too, if we're still remaining. Uh, so, I mean, think about it. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, right? He didn't say, I'm the rapturation <laughs> and the life. So I think our terminology is a little, um, I don't know, a little skewed toward this concept of the rapture. Uh, rather than the resurrection. And we don't really think about the resurrection until we go to a funeral of a loved one. And then we're all about the resurrection. But um, as long as we're alive, it's all rapture, baby. You know, <laughs> but um, the Bible primarily is about uh, the resurrection. And this rapture is, a, is just a portion of it. It's part of the complete breakfast of the resurrection. All right. But today, let's look at all the other scriptures about um about the rapture and see if it lines up, right? I mentioned in the first video, I told you to, to remember this phrase, the mystery of God. And I didn't do anything with it in, the, in part one, but in part two, we're going to dig into this because um, uh, the angel had said that in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, that the mystery of God would be completed. It would be, com it would be finished. Uh, it would be ended. It would meet its, uh, its full completion. So um, let's look at this. What, is, what does that mean? What is the mystery of God and how does it relate to the rapture? In Revelation 10, 6, and 7, here's where we find that verse. There should be de delay no longer, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. In Ephesians 3, 1 through 6, Paul writes, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, and by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. Verse 5 says, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Okay, he, Paul is saying that this mystery had not been revealed, but now he's revealed it by his spirits, by his holy apostles and prophets. Now, that goes back to that Revelation 10, uh, 6 and 7, where it says that the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. So the same phrasing, that this mystery has been declared by apostles and prophets. And Paul says, that's what I'm talking about here, the mystery of Christ. And he clearly, succinctly defines it in verse 5 of Ephesians 3, when he says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs with, by implication, the Jews, that the Gentiles and Jews would come together in the same body and be partakers of the promise of Christ. And that's the gospel. He writes again in Colossians 1, 26, 27, uh, 
that the mystery which had been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Again, this idea that the mystery in previous times was hidden. That's why we call it a mystery. It's intentionally mysterious. It was concealed. Now has been revealed. All right. Uh, verse 27, to them God willed to make known what are the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Again, the Gentiles being partakers of the riches of the glory of God is this mystery. And of course, it was a great mystery to the Jews, right? The Jews could not even fathom that even though God had uh, told Abram all the way back in Genesis that through you all nations will be blessed. No, the Jews kind of had their own special, uh, special prominent position with the Lord in their own mind that, hey, we are the Lord's chosen, we're God's favorite, and all y'all just get the leftovers. Y'all get the crumbs from the table, you know. But this is what the New Testament mystery of God or mystery of Christ is all about that the Gentiles are coming up and they're going to be grafted in just like Israel into the same tree. We see that in Romans eleven twenty five. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So there's going to be a fullness, a completion of, a finishing to the work of these of the Gentiles coming into the kingdom. So it, it's going to have a termination point. There's going to be a point where there's a cutoff, that it's going to be complete, all right? And at that point that it's complete, then that blindness that's on Israel is going to be taken away, all right? It's Colossians 2.2 2 goes on to say, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. So Gentiles are still coming into the kingdom. People all over the world are still finding salvation and giving their lives to Jesus up until the mystery of God is finished, which happens at the seventh trumpet. Does that seem to fit? That God would allow the Gentiles, this whole program that the, that the New Testament has to talk so much about, about bringing the Gentiles in with the Jews. And this whole program, this, this, this plan, this mystery that's now being revealed, that that whole plan is going to come to its finishing, its completion, its fulfilling end right before the seventh trumpet happens. Does that make sense? That that would happen right before a rapture? Hmm. Think about it. Well, let's look at some other ways that this uh, this passage of Revelation 14, the sickle reaping, uh, fits with other scriptural depictions of the coming of the Lord and the rapture. All right. Uh, first, that it fulfills all of these son of man coming on clouds prophecies, doesn't it? All right. Uh, Daniel 7.13 is kind of one of the big ones. It says, I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of, of days and they brought him near before him. So that's kind of the big one. This this passage is clearly the a messianic day of the Lord type of a passage. Matthew 26, 64 says, hereafter you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. This is Jesus when he was brought before the Jewish council and the Jewish leaders. He basically quoted Daniel 7.13 to them. It says it again in Mark 14.62, the same, same, uh, same occurrence. And Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. See, this, this, this concept of the Son of Man coming on clouds is so clearly understood by uh, the Old Testament scholars and the Jews that uh, that it was a messianic, it was uh, the day of the Lord, it was God incarnate returning to earth and bringing the, uh, the reward for the righteous and to execute judgment on his enemies. It was clear that the Son of Man riding on clouds or on a cloud was this picture. 
It was so obvious that when Jesus said that to them, that's why they rent their garments. And they said, you know, what, what else do we need? We don't need any other kind of evidence or testimonies. We've heard it from the man himself that he's claiming to be God incarnate in this moment. All right. So that's, that's a clear tie-in to this concept, this picture of the Son of Man coming on clouds. That is the day of the Lord. All right. Now, on the Mount of Olives, Jesus had already told his disciples that Mark, uh, in Mark 13, 26, he said, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Matthew 24, 30. And then all of the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with great power and glory. Uh, Revelation 1, 7 says this, Behold, he, meaning Jesus, is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, the Jews, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. Now, the last scripture I'm going to read to you about the clouds is from 1 Thessalonians 4. All of these previous scriptures have been primarily about the concept of the coming of the Son of Man or his parousia. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 says it like this, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him. That is the rapture, folks, right? And it's going to happen in the clouds to meet the Lord who is already in the clouds in the air. So that right there ties the rapture in with this moment that the Lord is in the clouds in the air. So again, we see from Revelation 14 that this son of man on a white cloud, he, he, he sat on this white cloud and he thrusts in his sharp sickle and reaps the earth. This is the fulfillment of all of these well-worn prophecies of the Son of Man. And we see that important link in 1 Thessalonians 4, that this idea that when the Son of Man, when Jesus is in the clouds, we're raptured to meet him right there. Okay? Now, the second um, concept that we want to dig into in this Revelation 14 sickle-reaping verse is this idea of the harvest, okay? Um, let's go to Matthew 13. Uh, we're gonna read several verses in this. This is a parable. Jesus told them another parable in verse 24. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in a field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed uh, weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, uh, the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, did, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? He replied, An enemy did this. The servants then asked him, Well, do you want us to go and pull up all the weeds? In verse 29 it says, No, because while you are pulling the weeds, you might uproot the wheat with them. So verse 30 says, Let both grow together until, until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters first, collect the weeds and tie them into bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Now we're going to skip to verse 37. And here's Jesus' explanation. He says in verse 37, he answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. And here the big, the big statement, the harvest is the end of the age. And in this parable, in this symbolic uh, teaching, the harvesters are the angels. So Jesus says clearly, that this concept of the harvest, where I'm going to have two types of reapings. I'm going to have one kind of reaping for the righteous, and I'm going to bring him into my barn. And I'm going to have a sec separate reaping for the wicked. And they are going to face, uh, they're going to face fire. They're going to face judgment. They're going to face wrath. Um, that is the harvest. That is the end of the age. And I believe that is why Revelation 14, um, uh, couches and, and uses the, the symbolic parable language of the harvest to show that this sickle reaping is the moment when God takes all of his righteous to him in the rapture. 
Here's some more about the harvest. John the Baptist in Matthew uh, 3, 11 says, But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Clearly talking about Jesus, right? And then he goes on in verse 12 to say, His winnowing fork is in his hand. What is a winnowing fork? Well, it's a it's a tool that harvesters would use at the time of harvest to to toss up the wheat so that it would separate the wheat from the chaff. His winnowing fork is is in his hand. Again, we're talking about harvest. And he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. James 5, 7 says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Until the coming of the Lord. Be patient. You know, there's a lot about us being patient. Until the coming of the Lord. Here is a call for the patience and the endurance of the saints. uh, Stated many times in the book of Revelation. But James goes on to say, See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Again, we're talking about harvest. The farmer waits and he ties that concept to the coming of the Lord. He says, Wait for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. Y'all, there's going to be a latter rain on the precious fruit that the Lord returns to collect and to to snatch out of here. There's going to be a latter rain. Believe it. Look for it. Mark 4, 29 says, But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. The harvest is the end of the age, folks. When Jesus gathers his good seed, whom he already said in the parable of the wheat and the tares, or the wheat and the weeds, uh, he says that uh, the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. That means get the harvest at the end of the age, Jesus returns and gathers the people of the kingdom. That's what happens at the seventh trumpet. That's what happens at the sickle reaping. That's amazing, isn't it? I love I love to see that. Well, we have some other scriptures that we need to look at because it's got to agree with all of them, right? If this sickle reaping at the seventh trumpet is going to be the rapture and we got to see it as such, it's got to agree with everything. It can't, we can't leave something unturned, okay? So let's go to some other scriptures um, that talk about uh, the rapture and our gathering to, to the Lord. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4 says, Now, brethren, Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Well, pause right there. The day of Christ is what Paul is discussing here. And he gives you uh, two elements of the day of Christ to further define it. He says, the coming of our Lord Jesus... And then he says, and our gathering together to him. The coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him. Now, previously, based on the tradition I was raised in, I always wanted to look at that scripture and think of the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him as happening on separate events. Um, I always wanted to believe that. I always read it that way. And it was because I kind of came to this scripture passage from my viewpoint and I was making the scripture fit my viewpoint. Um, and it wasn't until much later in life, uh, sadly to say that, uh, but hey, he's still working on me, right? Uh, it was much later in life that I realized that I could, I could see that Paul is really talking about the day of Christ, the beginning of the day of the Lord, and that these two concepts, the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him are really just two components of the day of Christ. And that the day of Christ is is too big and too much to even be contained in one 24-hour period, but it is a day that begins a season of, of his reward and his wrath on his enemies. Jesus doesn't take his wrath upon his enemies all in one day. It It's a season. He's got to fully uh, give them what they deserve and, and fully bring his wrath to, um, to the earth in order, to, in order to, to take over rule of the earth. He doesn't come as 
Joel Richardson says, he doesn't come with a magic wand. <laughs> he comes with a sword, and he's got to begin a campaign of invasion and overtaking the world so that he then can rule it for a thousand years. But this day of Christ is what we're looking toward, this one day that starts the whole thing. And I believe that happens at the seventh trumpet, as we've already discussed. Uh, but verse 3 says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed. So he gives two precursors here, two prerequisites that have to happen before this day of Christ happens. And this day of Christ includes these two concepts, gathering together and our, the coming of our Lord Jesus. Now, incidentally, he lists the coming of our Lord Jesus first and then our gathering together to him. Does that seem to fit with our sickle reaping that he comes in the clouds first and every eye will see him and then he thrusts in his sickle second? I mean, it's not like he sits there in the cloud for a long time after he comes. It's pretty back-to-back -back or simultaneous or even maybe in the twinkling of an eye. I'm not sure. But it, sh it certainly seems that the coming makes sense that it's first and then the sickle reaping. That's what we see in Revelation 14, the sickle reaping. And that's what we see here. And even in the way Paul lists these two ideas of the day of Christ. But he says that before all of that even happens, the falling away must come first, and the man of sin has to be revealed. So what does that tell us? Well, who is this man of sin, and what does it mean for him to be revealed? I believe Paul goes on to further define that, in case anybody's wondering. He says, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In case you were wondering, <laughs> how are we going to know if the man of sin has been revealed? Uh, I think at least by that moment, he's been revealed, which is clearly what Jesus prophesied, calling all the way back to the uh, book of Daniel, the abomination of desolation. This is when the Antichrist himself goes to the temple of God, which of course we don't have right now, but will be there at some point. So we've got to have a temple and then we've got to see this man of sin sitting in that temple claiming to be God. And then only after that can this day of Christ come. Does that seem to fit with what we have read in the book of Revelation? Yes, we see that clearly in the story of the beast and the dragon. That, that abomination of desolation happens and then we get into that three and a half year 42 month 1260 day period where the two witnesses are uh are they're preaching where the beast kingdom has authority and where there's this war on the saints happening during this time and that time leads up to and uh, it leads through the sixth trumpet and up to the seventh trumpet so that seems to fit with this Second Thessalonians passage here, doesn't it? Let me talk a little bit about these, these two ideas again. I'm going to go a little deeper in this idea of the rapture and the parousia, which is the coming, and how that they're connected in, 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 a, in a moment of time. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4.15 says this, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Now in the previous passage in 2 Thessalonians, that phrase coming of the Lord, the word coming there, is the Greek word parousia. And that is an arrival, an appearance. Uh, it's most commonly used by some type of head of state to talk about when a head of state enters um, a city and there's this big fanfare and, and he arrives on the scene. He's finally here. And everybody's been looking for it, and there's been preparations made for this arrival of the of the king or the president of some kind. So this word parousia has this big feel to it in its definition. Um, but there are other passages that use the same word. In 1 Thessalonians 4.15, which was written before, of course, 2 Thessalonians 2, 
where Paul is talking about the coming of our Lord Jesus and our gathering together to him. I mean, 2 Thessalonians builds on 1 Thessalonians, doesn't it? So we have to look to 1 Thessalonians to see how Paul has established his concepts. And that will help us to understand 2 Thessalonians even more. So 1 Thessalonians 4.15 says that there are going to be those who are in the Lord who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. Guess what? That word coming there is parousia. Paul's telling us that there are going to be Christians that are alive and remain until the parousia. And at that point, then he goes into talking about the rapture because those who are asleep are going to be resurrected and we're not going to precede them. So we're, we're by no means going to precede those who are asleep, who have to wait until the parousia. Man, that's, that's a pretty important, powerful truth there, isn't it? This also seems to agree with 1 Corinthians 15, 23 and 24. Paul, again, writing here later, he says, But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits being resurrected, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. That word they're coming is parousia. So at his parousia, at the moment he arrives on the scene, that's when we who belong to Christ will be resurrected as well. And of course, again, nobody who's going to be alive and remain is going to get to go before those who are resurrected. So if you're alive, you get to see the parousia and then the rapture, the snatching takes place. Another important concept that this sickle reaping has to agree with in Scripture is uh, is an important verse from Revelation 20. Let me just start with that. 20 verse 4, it says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now that passage right there, this is late in Revelation. This is after all the bowls are completed and everything. So saying that there are thrones and that there are those who are beheaded for their witness. They had not worshipped the beast. They had not received their mark on their foreheads or their hands. Now that reminds me of uh, the scene in Revelation 15, doesn't it? Where it says that I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with, with fire and those who have the victory of the beast over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name standing on the sea of glass. So this is the same, this includes the same people. So this is a very similar uh, depiction in these two passages. But in Revelation 20, it goes on to say in verse 5, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. So the righteous dead are resurrected first. The rest of the dead, the unrighteous, the wicked dead, they do not get resurrected first. Uh, their fate has been sealed. They may have been judged already, but they're not resurrected yet until at the end of the thousand year reign of Jesus. Because we who are resurrected with him, we reign for a thousand years here on earth as resurrected immortals in the same bodily form that Jesus had after he was resurrected. So we're going to reign with him. And there are going to be some, some sheep nations and those who maybe had not taken the mark of the beast during the great tribulation. Um, but they, they'll carry over and be a part of the earth and the people and the nations who have to bring homage and pay, pay honor to the Lord Jesus in Jerusalem at the feasts every year. But we're going to be a part of his administration as immortals, um, helping him to govern the earth that includes these these mortals who carry over into the uh, into his millennial reign, but it says in verse five, this is the first resurrection. So the first resurrection is of all the righteous people. That's the one that your grandma and your 
Aunt, you know, Ethel is looking forward to. We're looking to see them again in the first resurrection because there are only two. The resurrection of the righteous and the resurrection of the wicked. This resurrection of the righteous includes people who had not worshipped the beast, had been beheaded for their witness, and had not received the mark of the beast on their forehead or their hands. So the first resurrection does not happen until we get far enough into the great tribulation, the last three and a half years, where the mark of the beast is present and people are being beheaded, Christians are being beheaded for not taking the mark. That means this resurrection, which includes the rapture, does not happen until we are well into the three and a half years the last three and a half years. Does that seem to fit along with our revelation timeline with the sickle reaping and the seventh trumpet? You bet. It sure does. Wow. That's powerful. I, I have to be honest. When when I read that scripture and the Lord allowed me to read it and and I was able to see it with, with open eyes for the very first time, it it challenged my previously held beliefs because I was, I was looking forward to an, an earlier rapture uh, in my belief system in the tradition that I was raised in, and it was unsettling <laughs> to uh, to see a scripture and come across a couple of scriptures. That Second Thessalonians scripture was one as well, where it challenged me. It didn't agree. I couldn't. I couldn't make my my system of of eschatology fit in with this scripture. And I couldn't bend the scripture to to the will of my system. It was disappointing. Um, but but it, it it forced me into a season where I just I just said, you know what, Lord, I'm going to forget everything I know, everything I think I know about the end times, about the last days. I'm gonna burn it all to the ground and I'm just going to read over and over all of these passages until you start showing me how they all fit together. And that was a process that for me took a couple of years, really, before I really felt like I was able to see a picture, where all the puzzle pieces started to fit together for me. Um, And what's interesting is when I put the, the puzzle together that I was seeing in the scripture and using scripture alone, it didn't look like any other system that that I had read about. Um, there are elements of all the systems in it because everybody's got, you know, a piece of the truth. Everybody sees a, a side of it. But uh, I, it's very hard. It's very difficult, uh, I find, to to be able to put all, the, all of the pieces of Scripture into a picture where they all fit. And, um, that, and you know, eschatology is, is thought of as hard for a reason because it kind of is. But uh, if you commit yourself to it, I believe it's possible. The Lord will show you. So the last thing I want to draw your attention to is we're going to look at uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. Paul, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 52 that it was going to be at the sound of a great trumpet, the last trumpet, that all of this would go down, isn't it? You know, Jesus himself said In Matthew 24, it says, And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. They will gather together. He will send his angels. The angels are the harvesters. While the Son of Man sits on the cloud, he symbolically puts in his sickle. That sickle, I think, is is really a symbol of all the angels. Bring the elect to him bringing us together from the four winds of heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52 says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible 
and then we who are alive and remain shall be changed. And this happens at the last trumpet. Wow. Is the seventh trumpet in Revelation the last trumpet? Well, it's kind of the last of the seven for sure, right? I've also heard a very compelling teaching about the feasts of the Lord, the, the feasts of the Messiah, and how the uh, the Feast of Trumpets, or Yom Teruah, has a series of trumpets in it, and that there necessarily has to be a last trumpet. And uh, and when Jesus said, you, no man knows the day or the hour, that is a, a reference to that feast, uh, because they, they don't know when they're going to get to sight the new moon uh, to declare the feast beginning. That's a very compelling teaching, and and I kind of like it. Um, and honestly, there's nothing about what I've read in Scripture and what I've shown and taught in these videos, these two videos here. There's nothing that, that disagrees with that. So, it, you know, it could be both and. It could be the last trumpet on the day of trumpets, and it could be the seventh trumpet of Revelation as well. They could converge at the same time. I don't know. But I kind of like it. And God kind of does things like that, doesn't he? Where everything falls into perfect place and fits into perfect order. Now, it's interesting, this idea of the trumpet. Uh, if we're going to look at where it happens, uh, Jesus himself in Matthew 2 and 4, he placed this great trumpet sound and the gathering of his, of his elect sometime after the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24. Does that agree with the sickle reaping placement in Revelation? Yes. Does that agree with Revelation 20, where the first resurrection occurs after people have been a part of the Great Tribulation? Yes, because the Great Tribulation follows the abomination of desolation. So, the sickle reaping at the seventh trumpet, I believe it fits together with all the other scriptures, doesn't it? The scriptures about the last trumpet, the scriptures about the, the multitude that that said no to the mark of the beast, the, the concept of the harvest and how the mystery of God finally finishes right at this seventh trumpet before the rapture and all the other scriptures that describe when the rapture takes place and the components of it and the prerequisites of it. What we're seeing is that the rapture and the resurrection and the seventh trumpet sickle reaping occurs sometime very late in the great tribulation. No man knows the day or the hour. I don't, I don't know that we'll know exactly when, but at least it's very late. And honestly, when I, when I first realized this, I was, I was kind of discouraged. I was kind of defeated. I was kind of, you know, I, I wanted to be fearful in some way because when I expected an early rapture, I, I looked forward to escaping some things. And, even with what the Bible shows here, we still get to escape the wrath of God poured out in the seven bowls. So there is still something to escape, which is the worst of the worst. We're promised that we're going, we're not appointed to that wrath, as Paul wrote in Thessalonians. So I believe we're still not appointed to that, and we still get to escape that. But there's, it seems like there's plenty other that we don't get to escape. And that was discouraging for me. But then I came across this verse in John 12, 27. And this is, these are the words of Jesus. And he said, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. You know, if we have to go through difficult times here on earth, and as, an, as a, a Western American, you know, we've, we've been very blessed, especially as Christians, that we have not had to suffer the persecution that is happening in other parts of the world. Because there, our brothers in China and in the Middle East and in parts of Africa, and we have brothers and sisters right there, right now, who are going through great tribulation, you would call it. They would call it great tribulation and persecution. Some of them have been beheaded. Uh, others are killed in different ways. And I can't look at them and and then expect the Lord just to, I don't know, to exempt me from hardship 
simply because my system of eschatology required that. Because they don't get to. Why am I any different or am I better? No, of course not. And so the Lord had to bring me to a place where I had to see that that the great tribulation in these last days are not a they're not days to escape. And 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 as the body of Christ, we should not be looking to escape uh, these last days. We God is if we're gonna be here, then we're gonna be here for a purpose. We're gonna be here because God wants us to be here. And if God, if God has us here, he has us here for a purpose. He's got a calling on our lives to be the greatest evangelizing, soul-winning engine that the world has ever known. Because that latter rain will come and the harvest is going to exponentially grow during these times. And I believe as persecution and hardship rises against the body of Christ, that the power of the Holy Spirit will also rise and rise in us all the way through the 11th hour. And if we're called to be 11th hour workers, then we're gonna get the reward, hallelujah, that's coming with him. I can imagine that the apostles are up in heaven and they're just wishing that they could be a part, that they could be on the field for the, the final hours of this ultimate contest but they don't get to. If we're the ones that are called to be on the field in the crunch time, then God, let us let us rise to the occasion, being full of the Holy Spirit, not looking for a way to escape that hour, but to have the attitude and the mind of Christ that he had that says, it's for this very reason that I have come to this hour. Folks, you were born for this. We were born for this hour. Whatever, whatever the hour may come, whatever may come in it, we're born for this. And God's got a plan for you. Be full of the Holy Spirit and allow his power and his strength to over, overcome in, in the moment and, and operate in our weakness. Be encouraged. What a time to be alive. If we're heading into these last days, let's gear up for the greatest awakening the world has ever seen because we were born for it. The best decision you'll ever make is to follow Jesus for the rest of your life. And you can do that by saying a simple prayer like this. Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. And even though I'm guilty of sin, thank you for taking my death sentence. Now help me to live for you for the rest of my life in gratitude for you loving me so much. In Jesus' name, amen. That's all you got to do. So if you pray that decision today, I would love to help you grow strong in your new faith. I'm a pastor. It's what I do. <laughs> so use the link in the description to tell me about your decision. And if you do, I will send you a fantastic little book that will help get your relationship with God growing in the right direction. And there's also a link in there where anyone who wants to can just order the book directly. But if you're making that decision today, then it would be my honor to send it to you myself. And if you know someone else who needs to hear this message, then send the video to them, share it with them. All right, pay it forward. Be the light for someone else in the darkness. And uh, in the description, you'll also see my notes if you want to study uh, further. Okay, you can download those. So if you want to give me your feedback, then uh, hit me up on the socials. Just look for at last days pastor. And then of course, if you want to hear more of these teachings, then uh, subscribe, like, notifications, all of that stuff. All right. Hey now, so we've got to work while it is day because remember the night is coming. No man can